I'm going to wait a couple minutes before I start. Eric, I'm going to close the door now, my guy. Hey, Eric. Closing the door, man. I'll wait two minutes. Who's Jed Wapak? Jed Wapak, who are you? I'm gonna wait till five o'clock to start this, guys. Look at this. I got, my, I got a Jameson water cup. This should be a cool one. All right, it's 5 p.m. I'll wait just another minute before we get started. I'll do a little, like, um, housekeeping stuff. So two weeks from now, I'm going to do a tasting with Casey Stringer of Stringer Cellars, who... Um, operates out of Napa Valley and he's initially from West Bend and he's worked for some really cool wineries. He's roughly my age. I think he's about 40 um, and has his own small boutique winery. He used to work for Robert Sinsky, um, Honada, which is a producer in Santa Barbara County that that's owned by the folks that own Screaming Eagle in Napa. And um, he lived in New Zealand for a couple of years and that's actually where he got his viticultural degree um, we'll go live with him on the 20th. Um, I mean, he's a very talented winemaker. He's really meticulous about his sources, um, which is interesting to me. And, um, he, like myself, loves Santa Barbara County Syrah and has an extremely great Santa Barbara County Syrah that's part of the kit that we're gonna do. Obviously, this is a slightly more expensive tasting that we're doing with him, but you know he has Napa Valley Cabernet, which <laughs> is always never cheap, <laughs> you know. Um, all right. Who I don't. Okay, Jed. Jed Wapak. Jed Wapak. I, I'm just wondering who who you are. Who you who you are in real life. Um, all right, so that's the housekeeping. I'll do this because it's a couple, you know, it's about a minute after five now. Um, I'm Nate Norfolk. I am the wine and spirits director here at Ray's, and I'm also a certified sommelier. I've been here five years now. Wow, five and a half, actually. Um, these are really fun. And when I was doing the live uh, tastings, I never did a all Cabernet Franc tasting live. And I think one of you actually recommended this about a month ago, or or, or it might have was probably um, I bet it was Kelly Wall, 
and Kelly's emailed me a couple other ideas. And um, this is really fun. And I think once we go back to live tastings, I'll probably do a broader, um, a broader Cabernet Franc tasting because there's a lot of variety there. And uh, this is always interesting to me because it's kind of a, it, it's a grape variety that does very well in cooler climates. Um, and because of that, when it's also grown in uh, warmer places, it really shows itself in a, um, a, a, a kind of a different, a different way. And I, I didn't totally stress that, but we'll, we'll definitely see that difference in between in the first two wines. So hopefully everybody, everybody here sees, um, we're, I'm going to, I'm going to taste the wines. We're going to taste them in the order that I have them down, um, in the, uh, left-hand corner of the screen, the Chinon first, the Colonia Las Libras, um, Cabernet, Cabernet Franc next, and then the Ravines Cabernet Franc from uh, the Finger Lakes uh, will be the third and final wine. I um, hope everybody can see the PowerPoint all right. I'm stressing, you know, that's, that's the thing. Somehow it changed the font I was doing when I brought it over to this computer. Nope, no harm, no foul. All right. And for folks that are new to this, um, what we will do is uh, just feel free if you're logged into YouTube Live, just you can type any kind of question. I'll, I'll answer questions as they come in. Um, and uh, I'll try to be, I'll try to do that like as it happens. I sometimes get a little bit behind it. I might then answer kind of questions um, like a bunch altogether. And, and I'll try not to get too tangentially sidetracked. Um, feel free. A lot of folks want to know like food pairing ideas. Feel free to remind me to do that via the, um, via the comments. And, and I'll definitely put some, out, put some out to you. I'll probably touch on that as we go here. Um, okay. So I want everybody to make sure, like, like, don't, why don't you drink a little bit of the first wine? Have a little bit of the Chinon, because I'm going to talk for a long time, probably about an hour, maybe a little longer. So just start, start drinking. I know there's, I know, uh, Diana. Oh, wow. I think Dave's your, your dad. Dave's a good guy, man. Wow. He's probably watching this too. Um, like, you know. Drink, drink up. Everybody else, you were Wisconsinites, man. So, you know, like, I'm not going to keep people from getting their booze on. All right. The other Cabernet, Cabernet Franc. Um, I'm going to stress this a few times. So one of the, one of the reasons Cabernet Franc is grown in the places that it's grown is it typically ripens earlier than Cabernet Sauvignon does. Like almost always at least one week, if not earlier. And because of that, in places that get cooler in the autumn or fall, you know, um, it more consistently becomes ripe um, and it's somewhat e more easy to deal with in cooler climates than Cabernet Sauvignon. This is why, and I'm, I'm a little bit showcasing that, especially when we have wines from the Loire Valley, um, which is in at about 47 degrees north in France. It's a cooler climate. Um, the Loire is the longest river in France. It's over 600 miles long. And um, you, you can't consistently get Cabernet Sauvignon ripe there it's definitely not a place where you know i mean it's a kind of a place for cooler climate varieties um it's really more thought of as a white wine broadly as a white wine appellation but cabernet franc i think is the the red wine the red grape that's the most unique to the loire valley um and probably excels and makes the um most individual wine from there and that that has a kind of terroir and style that isn't really replicated anywhere else in the world. So, um, interesting, like we're getting into this. Okay. Ta -da. All right. And then we're going to talk about the grape variety a little bit. And, um, man, 
more and more, I'm, I like pay a subscription to a, wine set, a website called Guild Som, which, you know, Guild of Sommeliers, but anybody can join it. Anybody can pay. It's like a hundred bucks a year. And I get a lot of source material from them. Um, and they have pretty good PowerPoints and um, maps and so on and so forth. But, but more and more, um, I've, I, I use stuff from a free site called Wine Folly. And I love that Wine Folly has a lot of kind of infographic things happening with it. And um, they, they make it accessible to just lay folk, <laughs> for lack of a better term. And I think um, there's a lot of brevity with what they're doing, and they, they get to the heart of the matter very well. So I took this, this graphic from them. Um, these are kind of the dominant flavors of Cabernet Franc. And, like, before we get in, do a deep dive into, like, a little bit of the history of the grape variety and um, the like, where the geography of it and 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 some of the nuances. Let's just if if you have the opportunity, let's smell these three wines before we even taste them. Hopefully, somebody's you know drink the Chinon. Of course, it's the first wine. Yeah. Which to me, man, I just this has got like Stephanie's talking about how it has like kind of old leather, like stone, moss, earthy thing. And it to to me it totally, totally does. I get like a green pepper meets like like basil character to it a little bit. Um, yeah, and it and it smells um, it smells like like blackberries, like wild blackberries or blackberries that are kind of like just not quite quite ripe. And um, I'll say this a few times. And this is funny, in the Psalm movie, they talked about this, but but this is a little bit of what we call pyrazines, which are the um, the esters or the, you know, chemical aroma. Um, and by chemical, I mean, like, like these are, you know, as, a, as they occur in nature, not some kind of foreign, you know, like lab-produced substance. But, like, there's, there's what we call pyrazines, which is a group of esters, I believe, like, or, you know, aromatic compounds that that remind us a lot of like green peppers or like, like leafy vegetables sometimes too. I get a touch of that in here, which is really a, like a classic, classic thing in Cabernet Franc, you know, um, mm -hmm. I'm touch congested. It's always weird when, you know, like nobody else goes on, on, a live stream is all like snorty and trying to breathe really hard, but that's kind of part of the jam here. Yeah. So this is the Chinon and the more I smell it, the more I get kind of, kind of, I love that they said roasted pepper in this. Cause I, I start to get like a pimento y thing. Um, Kelly's over here saying olive. I can feel that like kind of like a black olive character character, which is something I, a lot of times I associate with Syrah, but, but this has got it too. And it definitely has like a pimento roasted red pepper or kind of chili pepper vibe going on. It's super stony to me too. Well, and let's, then we'll move on. Let, let's now, if you've got it open, just take a sniff. Don't, don't taste it yet. We'll, we'll smell the um, Colonia Las Libres, the second wine. This guy. Um, so... And I'll get into what, you know, how these things differentiate a lot. Um, this is grown in very high elevation in Mendoza in Argentina, which is a much drier area than the Loire Valley um, and, and tends to just, in a nutshell, have kind of more concentrated fruit character. See, now to me, this has a strawberry character to it a lot. Um, Oh, it's kind of crazy. I get like a melon rind, like, like, like cantaloupe or like, like that I've, that I've gotten, like when you get to the very, very bottom of it. And it, and it kind of smells like when you have like a, um, like it's weird. This, this wine is unoaked and I, and I'm getting a kind of a vanilla, vanilla thing out of it too, which is weird because I know it's unoaked and it kind of has a violet slash um like like purple flower character to it 
Whoa, Kelly Wall, smells like lipstick. Yeah, what is that, man? Dude, totally. Like, I think those are like lipids or something, or fat, fat, the fats in the lipstick that we smell when we smell like lip. Dude, that's wild. That, it, yeah, it does have a cosmetics kind of smell, specifically lip, lips, lips, uh, it's like, yeah, it's kind of watermelon rind, right? This is wild. So what's kind of really cool, like high, super high elevation red wines have a lot more, um, it's usually pretty dry at, above the cloud line in places and, and very, very sunny. And they tend to have really explicit fruit, fruit, or fruit aromas and sometimes even floral things. All right, now let's try, the, we'll smell the third wine. Just kind of, just, just, so we're getting some points of differentiation. Think about this. This is all like the same genetic material. It's all, it's all Cabernet Franc. Full disclosure, this, this wine's in barrel aged. So, so when we did, when we smell the Ravines wine, number, uh, the third one from, this is from the Finger Lakes, specifically Seneca Lake in, uh, New York. It's just... It's like 14 months, a little over a year in kind of used French oak, I believe it might be French and American oak. And I get oaky, oaky aromas to it too. Um, it's a little more, think about this, this is the older wine of the, of the three of them. And to me, it's the, the like least aromatic thing um, and has like a kind of, kind of sawdust. Like, um, like inside of a woodshed on a hot day vibe to it. <laughs> and it's not, it's not very fruity. Like I get, I get like, I get kind of the roasted pepper thing on this again. Yeah. And, and it is, it's a little funky too. Like it's a good way of thinking. It's a very hay. It has like a hay quality to me. I get a stoniness on this too. It's more like clay. Yeah, well, we'll get to that. And I'll find that this wine, wine when, I think it'll open up more as we do this. Especially, like, sometimes, sometimes, um, like, bar a lot of barrel-aged wines kind of have an extra level of complexity to them or aromatic complexity to them just from, A, they're, they're, they have a bit more exposure to oxygen, and B, um, the barrel in itself imparts flavors. Um, so there, there's usually some compl more complexity. It doesn't necessarily make the wine more intense. So, all right, we're going to keep going forward. Now we did with the sniffy sniff on all this. Yeah, man, I don't get like a, yeah, it's a definitely like somebody's saying like a cheese funk. I definitely get like a yeasty character to it. I don't know if it's totally cheesy to me. It's, 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 it's close. It's like weird, like yeasty and cheesy are, are, are pretty, they're, they're like similar they're very similar aromatically to people and and like both ideas both things have a very very like wide aromatic uh quality to both of them both cheese and and yeast which is like they're super complex and can uh, manifest themselves aromatically in a variety of different ways all right so um this is a cool quote though so to, to kind of sum up Cabernet Franc in a nutshell, Cabernet Franc, we'll, we'll look at this, and it's, it's really the progenitor, it's one of the parents of Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, Cabernet, Cabernet Franc is actually here. We'll look at this. So, you know, we got Cabernet Franc up here, and then we got Sauvignon Blanc, and its offspring is Cabernet Sauvignon, or Cabernet Franc up here, Sauvignon Blanc over here. Its offspring is Cabernet Sauvignon which is much more ubiquitous. Why? Because Cabernet Sauvignon is full-bodied, really lush, has very, very explicit fruit character to it, has lots of tannin, it, it yields an opaque wine. Um, and then, but then on the other hand, Cabernet Franc is also with Gros Cabernet, which is just a, one other thing in the Cabernet family, um, which you don't see, I don't know where it's permissible in France as a variety right now. Um, rather obscure, but it's the thing that leads to Carmenier, which is a minor, minor, minor grape of Bordeaux. And then Carmenier is more now associated with Chile and has very, very similar characteristics to me to Cabernet Franc, where it has the pyrazine kind of smell and it's spicy. And then uh, Madeleine Montre de Chiron is, is this 
whatever. This is an obscure grape variety that's parented with Cabernet Franc to make the ubiqu what now ubiquitous Merlot that rarely has the same purazzini qualities that Cabernet Franc can, but but will if and it doesn't have the spiciness um, that Cabernet Franc has and has lush, plush, soft tannins. Similar to Cabernet Franc. They, Cabernet Franc and Merlot have a very similar tannic profile to me. Um, and then an unknown parent and Cabernet Franc create a grape variety that is um, that is really uh, associated with the Basque region of Spain on the Bay of Biscay in northern Spain. Uh, Hondarabi Belza, which is used to make the rather obscure red wines of uh, Chacolina on the coast near San Sebastian and Bilbao. Um, whoa, crazy stuff. So Cabernet Franc actually is like, when they traced this back, they found that it's 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 more indigenous to the Basque area of the uh, Spain and uh, northern, or northern Spain and kind of southwestern France. Totally crazy, right? That brings me back to this, though. And I'll read this all out because it's it's Jancis Robinson. And if you don't like, if you don't know who Jancis Robinson is, just look her up. She's um, she's co-author of you know the very tomey you know Atlas of Wine with Hugh Johnson. She's a master of wine. She's probably about seventy now. Um, she's one of the foremost wine writers in the English language. She's English. Um, and, um, she's OBE, also Order of the British Empire. She's absolutely one of the best, best living wine writers, in my opinion, in the English language. Um, she's very pedantic. Um, she also wrote, like, the book called Wine Grapes, which is, for lack of, I mean, it's, it's, it's a textbook, for lack of a better term. Um, but it's, it's the definitive guide to, um, uh, grapes on earth. <laughs> um, and she over, it took her like, 10 years to write it. But nonetheless, I'm not a huge enthusiast of sexually stero the sexual stereotyping of wines, but even I can see that Cabernet Franc might be described as the feminine side of Cabernet Sauvignon. It is subtly fragrant and gently flirtatious rather than mascular, mascu massively muscular and tough in youth. Because Cabernet Sauvignon has so much more of everything, body, tannin, alcohol, color, is often supposed to be necessarily superior. But I have a very soft spot indeed for its more charming and more aromatic relative, Cabernet Sauvignon, or Cabernet Franc. Um, yeah, right? Um, I love how aromatic uh, Cabernet Franc is. I think she's spot on. She's a pretty smart lady. Um, Da, 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 da. We did that. Let's look at the color. The color of these. This is obviously like kind of a lighter red wine too, but it 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 rarely manifests itself in these dark dark kind of purple colors that we get out of things like Cabernet Sauvignon or Syrah, Shiraz, Petite Syrah. You know, really the warm climate varieties. Cabernet Franc really, really, really has like a just a a, a pretty classic ruby color, almost always going on. It's interesting. The Chinon is maybe a. It's it, this is like kind of the darkest of them, and it's throwing to me maybe like a touch of a kind of a hint of a purpley thing. But when I look at these wines, to me they're all they all show me that they probably come from cooler climates and that they're higher acid. Red wines that have um, higher acidity, um, without getting too geeky, like they just they, they have higher acidity show a more red hue. And because they're they're typically grown in cooler climates, they're not like super, super fruit bombs. So when we look at this, this is also from Wine Folly, you know, and just the kind of the profile is like Cabernet Franc is kind of medium in fruit fruitiness. It's not, it's not super heavy. When we have this Chinon, To me, it's more silky than it is velvety, you know? It has like a a texture. Like for Wisconsinites, I always, it's, it's really easy to kind of compare the texture of wine to, to milk products. Like this is, this lives more along the line of like a 2% milk as opposed to like, like, you know, half and half or like whole milk, like a lot of really powerful red wines are. 
Same thing with, the, you know, the it, it, like talked about the body. But it does have tannin. That's another thing. Like, you get, you you have the sensation of dryness with Cabernet Franc. Um, and, uh, and there is a little texture to it, too. That, um, but it's not, it's not extreme or heavy. The, the wine, the beauty of this as a wine, to me, as a red wine, is that, um, like, even when it's done in warmer places, it usually still maintains this kind of fresh acidity that reminds us of, like, more like the fruit from, red, you know, darker berries um, and or smaller red berries. Um, and uh, sometimes has a pomegranate character to me. Like the, the combination of the tannin and acid remind me more of pomegranate than the way the, um, than the actual flavor itself. Um, yeah, and somebody says they taste currants in the Chinon. Yeah, current, current is a pretty classic classic thing too and it's kind of like the cooler of a place that you get Cabernet Franc from the more it starts to have those kind of um the kind of currenty flavors um currents pretty high acid and and dark at the same time um or uh in in France we sometimes will say cassis <laughs> or in French current is cassis and this is always medium body I mean medium and alcohol sorry medium and alcohol these wines are all roughly at 13% alcohol. And nowadays, in kind of the global, you know, when we think globally of red wines, many, 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 many of them are in the 14 to 15% alcohol land. Um, where do we grow this? Like, we're talking, like, like, sorry, this is a little bit hard. If you're on a smaller screen, this might be harder to see. But uh, Cabernet Franc is really, really... Um, I think probably the mostly associated with Bordeaux, well, Bordeaux, and Lo, Bordeaux and Loire in France, really. In Bordeaux, there there's virtually no one is using uh, like solely Cabernet Franc. It's almost always blended with um, typically Merlot in um, places like uh, Pomerol, Saint Emilion, or uh, with Cabernet Sauvignon, specifically in Grave. Um, Saint Joseph, Saint Joseph, and the area called the Medoc. It's really seen as this this great, great blending grape um, because it does. You know, when, when we think about people talk about like red wine blends being an odd phenomenon to a lot of Americans, but if we go back to like before the industrial age, if you owned a vineyard. You, there's like no way you would plant just one grape variety because I'm going to, I'll use my, you know, an expletive here. You, it's like you and your family and maybe a couple of people that live within close, close proximity, you guys can harvest the stuff. You got one shot, right? And if it's shitty outside and there's rain or snow, you know, there's not going to be snow, but if it's rainy and cold in the, in the, in the fall, you're, you get screwed, man, you know? So if you have grape varieties that get, get riper earlier, like, you know, you're, you can play around with the timing of when you harvest things and your eggs aren't all in one basket. So especially in, in Bordeaux, which is a relatively like cool and wet place in the grand scheme of things, there are palm trees there though, by the way, but, um, it still gets, it's still relatively cold and rainy, especially in the, in the fall. Like you're, this is, this is, you know, you're planting Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot because you can harvest them at different times. And Cabernet Franc, you know, gets riper before Cabernet Sauvignon. So you're more likely to get really good wine from it if things go south and start to get cold or rainy um, during the harvest. But the Loire Valley, where the Chinon comes from, is really the um, place where, in France, Cabernet Franc is done as a mono-varietal um, Wine, meaning it's a wine that's just made from this grape variety. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the different um, soils of, of, of the Loire Valley and, and how that kind of affects um, the Cabernet Franc in and of itself. But, but the Loire Valley, in a nutshell, especially around Tours, which is the Touraine area, is really like the, the home in France of monovarietal Cabernet Franc. They're going more, growing, growing more of it in the Languedoc Roussillon. In um, near, we have one near Carcassonne, 
Um, and I'm not excited about those wines. To me, they, they're kind of commodity stuff. And But what is exciting is there's some Cabernet Franc out of places in Tuscany um, that make compelling, medium-bodied, gorgeously fruity wines that have that, that really do well when they're oak-aged um, and have the potential for longevity, too, from Tuscany. It's a really cool variety. Um, a lot of those wines are, are, are kind of pricey, and they're grown in, like, Bulgari near the Tuscan coast in the kind of places where a lot of super Tuscans come. And more and more super Tuscans are using Cabernet Franc. In California, we see this, especially in Napa, Sonoma, you know, because they're taking a page out of the Bordeaux book and they're blending it with Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, typically. Um, it's also, you know, also Cabernet Franc will be grown in the same places that Malbec is because Malbec's also a grape that's indigenous to southwestern France where, you know, where we make Bordeaux wines. So it's not weird. We're going to taste, obviously, a Cabernet Franc that's from Mendoza, Argentina, which is a, which is a wine region that is synonymous with Malbec, but this is Cabernet Franc from there. Sierra Foothills is the eastern part of France. We grow it there. Uh, more and more so in the Columbia Valley in Washington State. And then last but not least, they just, you know, as a footnote, they say New York. And that's where um, we're going to try this. The last Cabernet Franc we have is from the, um, the Finger Lakes in New York State. Um, and they grow it there because the Finger Lakes have a very interesting, like, I'm, I'm always reluctant to use the word microclimate because some people hate that but but the finger lakes have a climate that's a little bit different from the rest of new york and um i'll get into that when we get to those wines obviously it's grown in some some interesting places hungary uh the Kalshawa valley in chile once again because they grow it they grow cabernet sauvignon there stellenbosch parl swartland catalonia oop, catalonia um aragon castilla and la mancha um and it's a grape variety because it does well in cool climates. They're growing it in the Niagara Peninsula and southern Ontario in Canada. It's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, interestingly, Ar Argentina is mentioned here. Cabernet Franc has been grown in Argentina for 200 years. You wouldn't have thought it, right? Um, and other places, Australia, China, Uruguay, Brazil, New Zealand. Um, and that's going to bring us to the Chinon. So this is really the area that I that has become globally synonymous with just making Cabernet Franc, and um, everybody tasted the Chinon a little bit. So um, the Loire Valley, like a lot of places in France, I mean, definitely were um, the Romans probably brought, brought viticulture here in um, you know a, as they moved north throughout Europe and brought their kind of customs and culture with them here um and there were wild vines there at the time too but um uh oh yeah and then but but in turan specifically uh near, near tour is we know for a fact that like we've got roughly a 1500 year uh history of viticulture and um cabernet franc has probably been there for um at least since at least the 11th century um <laughs> And due to its proximity to Paris, like, and, and people having a demand for red wine, and this being one of the few kind of red wines that were relatively close, um, it was it's extremely popular um, in, in, and to this day, it's like, a, it's, it's something, you know, red wines from the Loire Valley are, are kind of ubiquitous in Parisian bistros and cafes. Um, and, you know, this is near the port of Nantes, which is the closest port in uh in France to England. So, a little about this. So this is, Bernard Baudry is, uh, um, his son now is Mathieu, and he's, he's the winemaker, but Baudry really took over their estate in the late 70s, created this estate, and has kind of added to it and added to it. And um, this area, the area that they're in is called Chinon, which is here. And if we look at, like, the northern part of uh, France, this is uh, – here, I'm going to draw this. This would be about 47 degrees north. So, man, this is like – this is like – it's like – it's like in, in Wisconsin, this would be like in Lake Superior. You know what I mean? Like, this is how far north it is or, like, kind of like about where the UP is um, or damn close. Maybe a little bit further south, but but north of Green Bay. So it's up there, man. You know, I mean, like, this is like, 
This is this is th- we're at the fringe of where red wine red red wine grapes can get ripe, and this main river here is the Loire, right? And Chinon is on this like tributary called Vienne. Um, and I could have illustrated that a little bit better. We'll go back to this. So um, and Baudry, this producer is really kind of thought of as like like really one of the traditional producers in. Um, uh, of, of Cabernet Franc. And he makes five different wines. This is called Le Grange, which uh, I'm not sure the, the connotation. The kind of, it, 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 it roughly means like the barn in, um, in French. But this is the closest, uh, on his estate, this is the closest um, plot to the river, and it's relatively young vines. He makes some wines that are more in like the forty, you know, fifty dollar range. Some of them are are um, aged in barrel, but um, this is with this is unoaked, so there's no wood to this at all. What we're what we're experiencing is alluvial soils, which are like former riverbed soils, which have pretty good drainage, but it's a cooler site than things that are like have a, a better like are on the hillside because as we get further away from the river, he gets to kind of south-facing hillsides. So this is younger vines and um, on a flatter area. Um, but, man, pretty cool wine. I, like, love that this is, like, super savory and has, like, a wild herby character to it. Um, I always joke about Cabernet Franc is, like, everything aromatic, besides the, like, pepper thing and, like, roasted pepper or, like, kind of neat it's not it doesn't manifest itself as like black pepper or like white pepper but it's like actually like peppers like green peppers or roasted peppers everything else about it is has aromas that are very associated with like temperate climate fruits and herbs you know um it kind of smells it reminds me of the fall a lot just the aromatic qualities of it Mm. um well there's some questions here um, oh, yeah. Taste Currents in the Chinon. They make some good wines from Cabernet Franc here in Virginia. Yeah, especially like Albemarle County. Um, uh, Albemarle County and areas in Virginia really, really have stressed Cabernet Franc. Um, once again, relatively coastal, you know, super. It's, it's a great variety that does well in, in humid areas, too, um, where some other grape varieties like Grenache slash Syrah, you can't, you know, they, they get, like, fungal and, and, like, mildewy. Cabernet Franc can really handle kind of wetter places, too. Um, great point. Rick is asking, why is the ravines in a Bordeaux, Bordeaux bottle and the other two in Burgundy bottles? Dude, I have no clue, man. I mean, I just don't even know. An aesthetic choice that makes is, is a weird one to me, too. I almost always associate Cabernet Franc being with, in a, uh, Burgundy bottle, probably though, because they're not growing Cabernet Franc at that, and they probably want to almost get consumers to subliminally associate with Cabernet Franc, and and buy this based on that as a selling point by proximity. Um, yeah. Um, any kind of questions about this wine, or a little bit more about the history of that? I, I do. I do point this out, and you know, we have a pretty dynamic organic and natural wine section here at Ray's. Um, this is an organic estate, just just FYI, if anybody, anybody is concerned with that. Um, yeah, Baudry is, every, everything they do is organic, um, and I think they're even certified organic. That's yeah, not on the back label, I don't know. But they're an organic estate. Um, he destems this, which is like it's pretty common. I mean, that's like that. Let, let's just think of destemming red wine or just wine in general. That's like the um, like that's the norm. It's it's odd to leave stems on, but he this is destemmed. Um, it's you know like cement vats, um, basically because that's the easiest vessel for them to do and. Um, do this in, and in, and is the most flavor neutral thing they can do. Um, and it's easier to use cement vats and do like gravity flow presses too. Um, and it gives you like initially in the early part of winemaking, you get the least amount of 
like oxygen content and having to transfer stuff around. Um, delicious. I super love this. Just like my bias is very pro this style of, of Cabernet Franc. Um, and I feel like this is like, this is like, to me, this is like classic, 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 uh, Loire Cabernet Franc and identifiable because of those kind of, kind of slightly, slightly earthy, stony aromas combined with, a pe- with, with like the pepper, strawberry, currant, uh, blackberry thing, and like a little herbal pyrazine thing. Oh man. This is good. I do want to say, man, these are super, super food friendly wines and you can have them with, um, they're great wines for burgers. I mean like a hundred percent. I think a lot of time more so than things that are really, really tannic. Um, they work very well with leaner meats and like game, game food, especially venison. Um, I, I love Cabernet Franc can be chilled and I suggest that you probably actually serve it more about 60 degrees. Um, or, you know, slightly below room temperature, 20 minutes in a fridge will do it, um, for sure. And I mean, you can even go a little bit of that. These are great red wines to have in the summer to me. And they've got like a little more snap and pop and acid to them than a lot of like domestic Pinot Noir would have at the same price point. And you can get pretty good high quality Cabernet Franc, um, with, you know, for around $20 as you're seeing with this, um, Excuse me, a little burp. Works really, really well with grilled meats, too. Um, it's a red wine that, this sounds weird when I say it, but it kind of works with cilantro, which is kind of makes other red wines, like, like kind of can accentuate tannin in a lot of other red wines. Or um, And I like this with relatively spicy food. I Once in a while, we'll have um, Cameron Franc with something like a dal or a korma. If I have a really hearty... Um, kind of northern Indian dish, um, they work well, especially when you do chill them a little bit. But this is just at just as home with all those things as it is with like basic pasta dishes or truffles or um, you know more funky cheeses. It can work with too, like washed rind cheeses and things like that. Um, do you have a favorite Chinon? Oh shit! Um, ooh boy! I mean, I like this. I like. Um, a producer called Palace, P-A-L-L-U-S. We usually carry that in store. Um, Jugo, which is hard to get. I mean, it's like, that's that's a weird one. Um, boy. Great question. I mean, he makes four or five wines. I don't always have access to all of the Bernard Baudry wines, but... Um, Man, I'm blanking on the other thing he do, does. And when we, when, I'll make, I'll do a little, go to a little graphic that'll show you. Um, he does a barrel aged, he does, some of the barrel aged wines from him, I think, are just out of this world great. And they're more in like the $30, $40 range. Um, and they, they definitely are more concentrated and richer than this. Um, I kind of wanted to do three wines that I felt were like kind of in a, on an equal playing field for this to kind of show off like a, more of a terroir thing. And I, and I, this is weird. This is, and this is a personal opinion and people argue this. Like, I kind of feel like for the sake of exposition, the more I get into barrel aged wines, the, the less the wine tastes like the place it's from and the more it tastes like the barrel. And that kind of can just skew us, the, the contextual aspect of us trying these all together. Kind of heady idea, but. All right, I showed you where Chinon is. We went over this. This is kind of cool. So this is like, this is the Baudry, you know, his property. And these are all his, um, uh, um, like the different kind of soils he has. So, um, oh man, and this, this gets a little bit confusing, but like calcare is basically like a limestone, right? Like, and these are, and then there's like a yellow, like, you know, a yellow calcare, which has a mixture to it. I don't know what my say says. Uh, Oh, shit. Uh, Millage. I should know. I don't know. Uh, Argile Silex. Silex is like a, like a, like a, um, uh, like a sandy, like a decomposed rock. Not like a sand, but like decomposed rock. Um, 
Pretty cool. And then alluvion, where this comes from, are alluvial soils, like soils that, you, that usually have some organic matter in them, but are usually kind of rocky and used to be seabed stuff. And that's where mostly this wine comes from. Um, man, I can't think of what his barrel aged wines are. But he does different red wines from these plots. And this kind of shows you, what's neat about this is this shows you like the appellation of Chinon has a variety of different soil types. Um, and they make, the wines from the Silex tend to be, whoo, they tend to be really very, like, A, a lot of them are, have a great exposure because they're like a south-facing hillside, but they tend to be more aromatic even than this is. Um, and in a really perfumey kind of floral way. Um, as do a lot of the wines from the Calcare, too, are, are even more aromatic than this. Um, this is beautiful, though, as an entry-level wine, I think, from... Uh, from Shinan. I mean, I'm not saying like you can immediately tell the difference from these soil types. Maybe we could, you know, if I had just four or five wines, it'd probably be more apparent, you know. Um, wait, any questions about this wine in particular before I move on? This is going to be the thing I pour more of for myself, by the way. All right, man, we can do this at the end. Definitely, like, I want everybody to take away from this that the Loire, the central part of the Loire Valley, you know, here, this is the whole Loire River. Like, and this is the the, the broader Appalachian, um, you know, is like from here to here is over 200 miles, right? or two, almost 300 miles, and the way it twists and turns, the river itself ends up being about 600 miles long, right? I think of France is like roughly, like it's a little bit bigger than Texas. Um, but they're, they're, they're more prepared for snow. Ooh, ouch. Um, Chinon, so cool, so weird, kind of crazy Appalachian. Um, these guys do, and in Chinon, if you ever see like Chinon Blanc, like white wine from Chinon, it is Chenin Blanc, but it's done in a dry style. Yeah. Like, I love this wine. I mean, I think, um, I, I taste a fair, like, I'll, I'll be honest, don't go out there and think like every Loire Cabernet Franc is going to be this good. Because some of them are really mean, green, lean, light, and... And, and really acidic. This has got, like, it's this is super balanced for, for Loire Cabernet Franc and from a really good producer. This is a region I think is very, very producer-driven. Um, I'll... And these wines, you can age them, even the basic stuff, for three to five years. No problem. Um, I don't think this is going to get, like, like, it's not going to become this incredibly better wine. Like, it'll become less tannic over time though um and those tannins really will soft out and if you like this a little bit silkier a few years um a few years down the road will uh will like soften the tannin out on the wine okay so um this is we're gonna try the uh colonial las libres cabernet franc reserve now i'm gonna drink a little bit more of the chinon though mm. man it makes me want to have like a burger with like arugula, goat cheese, and olives on it, like and like and like green olives, like, yeah, and like I just want to have that with this like right now. Okay, um, okay, or lamb. I didn't even talk about that. Like Cameron Frank's pretty great with lamb too. Um, because we talked about the gamey thing. It's a, it's a great red wine for gamey foods. Um, oh, hey, another thing. Hey, guys, like, if you can, if you want to order, I, I, I did a, I put the deal on the website for all these wines. So they're available to buy through the website. And they're, um, and I put discounts on all of them. Like, these are 18, this is 18.99. The... Las Libras, I think, is going to be $15. I can't remember. Maybe it's $13.99. But please, if you can, if you want to get the wines, if you can put a pickup date 
and if you buy them through the website, you can get a pickup date of um, the tenth, like went next went next Wednesday. Um, that just that just makes makes sure like no matter what happens, I can stage these and have everything ready to pick up by that date. If you do it earlier in there, it it can get a little dicey if I sell out of something. You know, like no matter how much I buy of these wines in advance, sometimes I can sell out something. If we do it for the tenth, I can make sure your order is filled and you can get it. Like no matter what, it gives me time to handle any extraneous details. Um, Bradley Wells, Texas, is about five percent bigger than France. Was I close enough? Was I close enough for you, buddy? Good to see you, or good to talk to you. Um, Oh, wow. Oh, pretty well with some chorizo. Oh, yeah, dude. Uh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Dude, I think it will really like mushroom ravioli. Like, I know it's it's so hard to cheat on Italian food with French wine, but hey, why not, right? I mean, like, like that's kind of where they're getting a lot of their ideas anyways. Um, or, like, Italian winemakers are getting a lot of their ideas from France, and not, but not Italian food isn't getting yeah okay um all right let's let's take let's do the sniff we did the sniff we're gonna try this man this to me this is so much more floral than the chinon was and it has like a um it definitely has like a violet a violet character to it a little bit like almost like freesia or like a more exotic flower to it too, like a tropical flower. Kind of lit. It's something in like the lily family. I don't want to get too off track with this wine, but this is called uh, Colonia Las Libres, which is like colony of the rabbits and. Hey man, rabbits, they like vineyards. <laughs> it, like, it, it, it sometimes is an issue. Um, the parent company is, is, is a winery called Altos Las Hormigas, um, which is in Luján de Cuyo in Mendoza. That's actually where this comes from. It's a subregion of Mendoza. This is about, this is like 2,700 feet elevation is where this guy is. Um, Whatever flower they use to, yeah, lavender. That's a good call. Yeah, yeah, yep. And it's berry. It, and this has more, isn't this interesting? To me, this has a much more like red fruit kind of character to it. Um, and it almost reminds me of like the sour cherry candies that were like, dude, who knows what those are called? You know what I'm talking about? They're like about like as big as like the tip of your pinky. And they were like a sour cherry candy. This has a smell that reminds me of those so much, man. I notice like this doesn't have like the, to me it doesn't have like the herby, earthy green characters. That goes away when you do viticulture at extremely high elevation. And some of you, this is a totally subjective thing. So if some of you guys are out there getting like more of the herby green stuff, let me know. I'd be, I'd be curious to hear, to hear that. I'm always convinced that like, certain aromatic qualities just like us like as beings like physiologically each of us have different thresholds for, for certain aromas like uh, that we can detect them at um oh and you know stephanie larson saying hey this wine seems to have one note could be promising on the patio and chilled this is a this is a really astute observation and it's kind of my main criticism of many what I would dub new world wines, like wines from kind of warmer viticultural regions. And I'm painting with a very broad brush here, but there tends to be, there's a tendency in certain areas of the world where like it's almost too easy for the grapes to grow. <laughs> And like picking and choosing what's the best fruit and what isn't isn't as difficult in other places, and we get wines that have a kind of 
kind of, this is very, I, I feel like this is a little too subjective, but, but kind of don't have as broad and, like this is a wine that's more about intensity than it is about complexity. So, whereas the Chinon to me is a very, very, very complex wine, and, and that's, a, that's maybe one too many um, qualifiers, but it's a complex wine, and this is a wine that's much more intense. Like the, the the intensity of the fruit and the intensity of the aromatic quality are are very are, are really upfront to you, but there's not a lot of complexity to it. And I, I love that idea. Like to me, like the concept of having one note is is really beautiful to me, because, and and it explains it in a really good way. Thank you, um, because a wine can be like intense, but not being complex. And this is this is that to me. Like there's there's, and and sometimes that's great. You know, I think people like that in. I think a lot of people love that in wines. I think a lot of people love that in like um, what I would call commodity wines. And we sell, you know, the, there's millions and millions of cases of wines like that sold throughout the world. I think a lot of the kind of the inexpensive California red blends also have a lot of intensity, but not complexity. I kind of dig this though. And like, I think this would be a, a really fun, like kind of like chips and guacamole red wine. And I think you could, like, once again, I can't stress enough how great Cabernet Franc is when it, it has a little bit of a chill on it. And, like, the ravines, actually, I pulled out from the basement of Ray's when I um, when I got it uh, today. And um, and when I first opened it up, I was like, oh, man, I love, it's like, a, this, like, like this perfect temperature, which is probably, like, right at, like, 60 degrees. And it was, oh, my gosh. This is kind of the beauty of red wines from, from Argentina especially, is they do have these really cool floral qualities to them and these ultra hyper, like, like really intense fruit characters to them. Um, you know, uh, man, are these ever different from one another, right? But it's cool because they have a, to me they have a really similar texture and body and even the acidity is close, but the flavors are 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 almost like un are almost unrelated. They're like, ah, oh man, I don't even know. You know, it's like they're in the same league, but they're like different. They're even in, on the same team, but they're like they they do different. They do different stuff. They're like cousins almost. You know. Um, Man, it really reminds me of those crazy sour cherries, and I can't remember what those things are called. They came in a white box. It was a candy. The box was about, like, yay big, you know? What produces the floral notes of this wine? Okay, so, hey, man, I am so not a scientist, Brad. So, um, but, but viticulture that takes place kind of a lot of times in ex places that have the potential for an extreme amount of photosynthesis. Um, the, 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 the anthocyanins, like the, the part of the grape, for the, the skins of the grape really basically super intensely aromatic compounds are being created in the skins of those grapes because they're up at high elevation and like really receive a ton, ton, ton of, like unadulterated sunlight and a lot of times wines in these areas have to kind of have like a lot of canopy like have to have specific canopy management and they'll do things to kind of like 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 make sure that the the basically the the vines don't get sunburned too um yeah that's what's going on probably more so you know they're, they're not worried about like it being too cool or rainy here um they're more like, man, it could get, it could get too hot, or we could burn the grapes, and that's what's kind of going on with a lot of those super floral characteristics. Especially, we get them out of really high elevation vineyards a lot. Um, you know, Malbec, Malbec also certain clones of Malbec really have very very floral floral characteristics. And if anyone remembers, like if if anyone did the virtual tasting where we we had um, Dan Pilkey from Paul Hobbs Imports. We tasted a Caor, a Malbec from southwestern France, and then we tasted, obviously, the 
Bromir um, Malbec from Mendoza, and they had the same kind of like, you know, the French wine was like super herbaceous, like complex, like really, really dark, and like had this kind of brooding tannin. And then the 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 um, Malbec from Mendoza had this like floral, really like explicitly berry compote kind of character to it. Same dichotomy, man. Really? Wow. No, but it's not the Ludens. I mean, this kind of has the Ludens thing. I know, man. It kind of has the Ludens thing. This was a sour cherry candy. And I was thinking the Ludens, the Ludens came in the white box. This is a sour cherry candy that actually came in a red box, now that I think about it. Damn, dude, it's a sour cherry candy. It reminds me of the of it more on the palate than on the nose. And they would make you super salivate. Yeah. I'm curious what people think of the acidity of this wine. Because I, I, I like love how it's like very bright um, and it's mouthwatering. Almost more so than the Chinon. Like that's kind of a, like as much as we're saying this is a one note wine, like to me it's really, it almost has a refreshing character, which I rarely find in a red wine, you know? And you can see why it could be chilled and like, like, and, and, and this is a red wine also that works with things like ratatouille, you know, and ha like Cabernet Franc across the board works with like, you know, pepper or green pepper or vegetable based dishes in a way that a lot of other red wines just don't, can't fuck with, you know, um, it's a hard candy, Lisa. It's a hard candy. It's like, it's like, it's big, it's a red, it's like a ruby red hard candy that's, that's that's hollow on the inside that is like a sour cherry candy. God damn it, this is gonna, I'm sorry, we're obsessing over this. We should, we should move on, Let's just move on. But if somebody knows it, let me know, man. Cause, cause now it's, now it's a thing and it's out in the universe. It's a hard candy, it's, it's, but it's like, it's, it's hard, but you bite into it and it's, it's like a lemon head, but it's cherry. In fact, I'm sure it's the same people that make lemon heads make this. It's probably cherry sour. It probably is cherry sours. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Questions about the, the Bonarda? Oh, sorry, I said Bonarda. Questions about the Cabernet Franc, the Colonial Las Libras? I do want to say that, that it was probably, a, interestingly, 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 Cabernet Franc has been grown in Mendoza in Argentina for 200 years, and it was probably folks from the Veneto or Northern Italy, where Cabernet Franc is also grown, that brought it here. Maybe folks from Southwestern France, where Malbec is also comes from, who knows? But there's, Argentina has a huge, 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 huge Italian community. This is a kind of cool winery. And once in a while we do the Altos Las Armigas red wines in there. The Altos Las Armigas wines from these guys are like, like in the $30, $40 range. Kind of a fun, super value. Right. Um, yes, Stephanie, hard outside, juicy center. Okay. Oh, I'm so glad they're called cherry sours. Is everybody thinking that this kind of reminds you of cherry sours? Am, tell me, I you you can tell me that I'm a crack and crazy, but it reminds me of them totally, and I. I I mean, I'm 42 years old. I haven't had one of those things since, I don't know. Like, it's been probably 25 years. It was, yeah, at least. Oh, now somebody's, now, oh, God, you guys are killing me. All right. Questions? A little bit of where this is. See, Luhan, Epu, North Mendoza. Mendoza is the main city in Argentina because Mendoza actually there's a river here and there's Andes snowmelt and there's water it, there's water under the city so it's it's like um it, it's very arid here it's it's kind of wild and Mendoza itself is roughly the size of Milwaukee but their airport is about like a fifth the size of Mitchell <laughs> It's like the craziest, like, like what is this airport I've ever been to? Like, we're really, we're getting on a plane here. <laughs> like, um, all right, man. 
Yeah, cherry heads. Okay, no, are they really cherry heads? I'll have to look, I'm going to look this up immediately when we're done. Um, cool. I mean, everybody kind of digs, you know. One, one thing I will say about, you know, I, I hammer this home every time we do a wine class. So, you know, here's the basically this, the border of Chile here to the left and Argentina here to the right. The border is basically the peak of the Andes Mountains. And because of this is so high, any kind of weather system from the Pacific Ocean here on the west is really just like totally, totally stopped by the Andes, um, the second highest mountain range in the world. Um, and then because thus, because of that, Mendoza's in this crazy rain shadow, man. And it's like Mendoza, if 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 God were like, I'm gonna make a place that's just perfect for organic viticulture. Mendoza is probably it, really. I mean, it's like it's it's like it gets tons of sunshine. It rains just enough. The problem they have is hail. That's the big problem is they they actually have hail. Like rain, it's so high up that like instead of rain, it's just like okay, it's too cold anywhere up higher than this. It's just gonna be hail. So that's a problem. But then there's like very few you know bugs and all the shitty critters and there's. Not fog and like you know frost and like it's it's in this really really sweet spot. Um, Band aid and barnyard go together. Yep. All right. Cool. All right. Now we're gonna look at the ravines. You, here's a wild thing. Does any whoever you know the folks that are actually kind of kind of bopping in on this. Um, did any of your bottles have with, with this wine? Well, let's taste it. We're gonna first, first let's taste it, because we did the smell right, and to me it has a very barrely kind of kind of barrel character to it. Do you taste Breton Mises in number three? There he is. I thought it was a little bready, but it's kind of like I don't know if it's Brett. I get a hay. I get like a mat. I don't think it's Brett, because. Brett and Mices, for those out there, is like a wild yeast strain that can really, really smell kind of like horse, a horse stable. Or, um, I mean, it just, yeah, it just smells like a funky barn. It's really barnyardy. Um, yeah, man, I, I get, I get more like the hay and like old wood thing than I do the Brett and Mices, which are really close, which are really, really close. And certain grape varieties tend to almost have a Brett and Mices kind of yeast to them. Um, like, like M Mouved from, from France can do it, especially like in, uh, in the Bandol area. I'm totally digressing. That was super geeky. I apologize. Um, Yeah, it's kind of funky. So, um, yeah, there's a green pepper. There's the, there's the pure. This has the pyrazine thing to me too. Oh, Diana. Yeah, it's totally coffee. Yeah, and it's almost like this. sounds weird, but it's like it's like. Um, it's almost like coffee that you've let, like it's macerated too long, you know, like co coffee that's coffee that's gotten like sat with the grounds a little bit too long. Yeah, there's so many things that are non fruit aromas to this too, you know, that are those secondary bar barrel flavors or aromatics. I want to show you guys where this is. So this is in Seneca Lake is like, it's like the deepest of the Finger Lakes. And these are what we would call, they're, they're rift lakes in, um, oh shit, are they rift lakes? Damn it. They're not like, they're really, really deep, but nonetheless, because um, I don't know if they're glaciated or if they're rift lakes. I really should know this. Like, this is why I'm not an advanced sum. I'm just a certified sum, because like, I would... Like if I want to do the advanced sound thing, I gotta, I gotta like, I gotta know this backwards and forwards. Um, yeah, it's super nutty to me too. It's got like the nutty hay, old wood. There's a little leather. There's like a cold leather quality coffee. Like I get, 
I get a dried strawberry on this too, and I get a little bit of a like a craisin. <laughs> it's really red fruits. Um, so 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 interestingly, like Seneca Lake is like the deepest lake here in um, in the Finger Lakes, which are in kind of you know this this kind of central western part of New York, and because they do two things here, the um, there's a lot of sunlight here. The, the, the lakes themselves have this really amazing way of, you know, you know, amplifying sunshine. And, but, it, but it never gets too hot here in the summer. And the depth of the lake really, really lets, allows it to make, have this kind of slightly warmer character to it during the early, er, like early autumn than the surrounding area. It retains heat. And, um, it's, uh, like, this is a really interesting place, especially for, like, you know, it's, it's an area that's more associated with Riesling, and I think there's some really, really cool Riesling coming out of here, um, that is a very unique style of Riesling that's, like, especially things that are off-dry and not super sweet, and they have a, um, really beautiful kind of, like, citrusy fruit yuzu character to a lot of them, um, and, and, this is cool enough of an area still where like Cabernet Franc is the main red grape variety that can, um, um, that, that, that they've really kind of hung their hat on and they didn't really do so until about 50 years ago. And there's, there's a huge history of that. Stephanie, yeah, I'd, I'd love to do like a Finger Lakes thing too. And, and, and uh, I think, I think, I, I think I'd want to do enough wines though to like show kind of variety and um, do like, you know, back w when we can actually do live tastings. I think this is something that would warrant like eight wines. This wine's crazy to me though. Like, like when I first tried this, I was like, I couldn't quite wrap my head around it because I was like, like it's, 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 it's definitely not like the Loire stuff. Right. And like they barrel aged this enough where it's really got the barrel character and kind of funky, but it's still cool climate. They do some, they do Pinot Noir here too. To kind of mixed results, in my opinion. Um, ah, yes, they're glacial lakes. I, when I started saying rift lakes, I was like, I'm crazy. This, this can't be fucking glacial lakes. Yeah, they're rift lakes. Or they're, I mean, they can't be rift lakes. They've got to be glacial lakes. Yeah, but they really, really dug, dug deep. Um, yeah, I mean, Seneca Lake's a lot smaller, but it's, as, you know, it's almost as deep as Lake Superior. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, guys. I, I, as soon as I said it, I was like, I'm just on crack. Yeah. Um, thoughts about this? It's kind of wild. Like, I love the barrel character of it, though, too. And I think, like, once again, I talk about, like, game or, like, ratatouille or, like, braised meats or, like, grilled stuff. This, is a, this would be a cool wine for it. I'd also, like... I'd love to see like an actual like Munster from Alsace or like kind of like a um, wash rind cheese and how this would play with it. I think like some really funky cheeses would probably bring out the fruit of this wine or very like savory earthy foods or like truffles or something like that or mushroom based dishes would really accentuate the fruit. The more I have it, the more I start to get like, um, You know, the more I get a fruit character out of it, it's like kind of like a basic cherry kind of dried strawberry thing. Um, but I wonder, I one of my, I, the first bottle I opened to this had, um, it was going through a secondary fermentation and had a little, it didn't have a spritz I could see, but it had a bubble I could feel in the mouth, which is really weird because this wine's dry and that usually only happens to things that have a little bit of sweetness left to them. Um, and I shouldn't say that. I mean, there's, there's, there's more to it than that. Um, but let's get into this. So this is all Cabernet Franc. Um, it's from three different vineyard sites. Um, and it's loam and limestone soils. Limestone soils are great for, for wine because even though they're called limestone, they're actually low in acid. So they create higher acid wines, which you want. Cause if you don't have that, you get flabby wines. Um, oof. Okay. The all the grapevines are probably in the about twenty years old range here. Um, 
It's destemmed. Um, punch downs and pump overs, which is a thing of just like kind of exposing more of the juice to the skins to get more concentration and color out of the wine. 14 months in two-year-old French and Slavonian slash Austrian casks. That's the, that's the fun guy here. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay, Chris. Chris, your wife got the, um, the, um, your wife got some of the bubbles. Yeah. Yeah, man, weird. I mean, like, if, if somebody got one that is, that does have a little bit of a secondary, feel free to bring that back. That's kind of fucked up. It's, that's a flaw. And I opened a second bottle because I got that. Yeah. Fungi. People are getting some funk out of this thing, man. That's funny. They, they actually, this is like, this is kind of one of the most renowned wineries out, out there. Um, like, Dude, usually in, in a class, I would do, like, let me see a show of hands because I'd want to see, like, what what folks um, want, uh, you know, what folks think about this. Any, any questions or comments? It's kind of wild. Kelly's saying all three of these wines are kind of young. This is, the, this is the oldest of them. Yeah, I, I definitely think three to five years. Yeah, this, this, I don't know. I would love to see what this wine's like when it's, like, actually, like, more, like, seven to ten years old man I, i'm really intrigued by this like what is ta oh um total total acid Dude, that gets weird. That that we don't need that. That's a whole man. That's like chemistry that's beyond me. pH, I can understand. Yeah, T, yeah. TA equals how tart it is. Um, yeah. Whereas pH is the pH is is pH. This is a wine, the more I drink it, the more I like it, though. De definitely, you know, of them. I'm kind of, I'm going to go back to the Chinon. Oh, man, that's good. It's weird. When I go back to the Chinon, the Chinon's definitely, like, has, like, a earthier, like, a like a somebody just stirred up the soil kind of earthy flavor. Where this is like earthy in like a in like a yeasty hay like dried straw kind of way to me. To me this is the least tannic wine, too. And I think that some of that is from the barrel aging. Uh, oddly, because we think about barrel, like using a barrel to concentrate the wine, but I feel like this this adds some, you know, like oxygen to it, and it kind of dampens down some of the fruit aromas. Um, it could be the clone. I know nothing about like the clone of of um, Cabernet Franc that they're using here. I mean, totally. Um, oh wow, yeah. These are kind of crazy, isn't this? Isn't this wild? Like, Cabernet, Cabernet Franc has a pretty broad... What's neat about it is, like, it rare, it's not... It's very rare to be a full-bodied wine. And, in fact, I don't want a full-bodied fucking Cabernet Franc wine, man. There's enough just ginormo, giant red wines that are just here to... We know, like, as a consumer, after you've had five wines, like... Five California red wines. You you know how to go find some just you know like like caveman club of a red wine. You can do that. Like like finding grace and like subtlety and like more complex wines that have 
you, you know, some variation to them is really, is really to me, I, I mean, what's fun about wine is that these are definitely the same raw material, but they, they, in context, we get to see the difference, which is, which is really, man, I like, love that. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thanks a lot, Ted. Yeah, man. This is always what I'm going for is like, I mean, like if I'm doing my job right, I'm finding, th we're, we're, I'm showing context too. I will say this about Cabernet Franc from, from New York. It, 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 a lot of it kind of, kind of has this vibe to it. And a, a lot of folks do use wood. Um, the wines tend, for some reason, the wines tend to not have the same kind of, kind of gripping acidity that Cabernet Franc from other places have, even though it's a cool climate. And I, I don't know, I don't really know the, um, overall concept behind that, you know? Um, yeah, man. And I'm going to just open this up for questions, you know, like tell me if there's anything else you guys want me to kind of, kind of, um, kind of, kind of, kind of elaborate on. Chris, secondary fermentation is, it does mean that there's some residual sugar there and that there's still live yeast. It takes, you need two to tango. You need, you need, I'm a little yeasty friend. Ah, I'm still alive in your wine. Then I'm a sweet little sugar and I, we're going to get together. And when we're trapped inside of a wine bottle, if my little yeasty friend eats me up, yummy, 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 sugar, sugar, sugar. Yeasty, yeasty. Oh, you're eating me. Why are you doing that? I'm, I'm dead now. Oh, poopy, 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 bubble, 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 poopy, bubble, 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 CO2, CO2, poopy, poopy, bubble, bubble, fermentation. Bye-bye, <laughs> sugar. Yeast likes you, but I'm not dead. I'm still alive. It's a really juvenile explanation of secondary fermentation. I'm trapped inside the bottle. I'll come out when you drink me. Yeah, if anybody got, <laughs> if anybody got one of these, um, and they are bubbly, return it. It's so weird, man, right? Like, it was, I was kind of freaking out. I opened the first one. I was like, oh, no. And then the second one was fine. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. I'm, I'm actually going to go back and, like, try this because I had one, man. This is so weird. Like, hey, this it, – it's always – it's wild, man. Like, I, it usually happens when I get, like, weirder sweet red wines, you know? And usually if secondary fermentation is happening, you would think, like, the wine is, like, oh, the wine's going to be kind of sweet. But actually what happens is it manifests itself, like, the wine tastes super, super dry and astringent. Dan, if that if that disturbs you, glad you didn't see some of the bands I was in like 15 years ago. Hmm, man. And interestingly, for, for New York Cabernet Franc, this has actually got a fair amount of body. I am a Chinon. I do not have any residual sugar. Sucre. 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 Yeast, yeast, yeast. Sucre, sucre. No. No. Wow. Man, 
Sorry for all the drinking noises. How gross is that? Yeah. All right, guys. Anything else? I'm going to, I'm going to like knock it down in like three minutes. Good nasal. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I actually got what I would consider to be inebriated probably for the first time since New Year's, which I don't know, for non-Wisconsinites, that, that's, that, 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 whatever. Like, that I went, like, 60-some days without actually being drunk. <laughs> but I think I, I think I got drunk on, what? Last thir on Thursday? Yeah, I kind of got drunk on Thursday, yeah. But it was drinking, like, cognac and bourbon and, and beer because I don't drink those things, and, like, like my body's acclimated to exactly how much wine I can drink. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Three sheets to that one. <laughs> mm. Yeah, the Chinon is just, it's a brilliant wine. They're, they're a very good producer. And in fact, like in 2019, one of their, one of their, one of their Chinons was, um, um, one of their Chinons was in Wine Spectre's Top 100 Wines of the Year. Um, you know, Bob, I, uh, Robert Mangan, I've never been to the Finger Lakes. Um, people rave about it, though. I've got a couple of folks that are really super, super into it. And in fact, it's kind of on, I mean, for per personally for me, like, I'm, I'm going deep here, but like, I've been to Buffalo before, and like, I'm, I'm kind of like, I really love Art Deco architecture and uh, kind of early 20th century architecture. And there's a lot of really, really cool things in, in, in Buffalo that I want to go see from an architecture perspective and get deep into. Um, and I want to take my family to Niagara Falls, and I would I think we'd probably swing by here, um, you know, to, to go to a couple of wineries just because. And then there's the whole um, Adirondack forest thing. Oh, plug the next tasting again. Okay, so two weeks from today, it's Stringer Cellars with, um, it'll be myself with Casey Stringer, who is the winemaker, and he's initially from West Bend, but he's lived in both New Zealand, and he's worked in Napa and, and uh, Santa Barbara County, and he's worked for Fiddlehead Cellars, who make probably like arguably one of the, like a super cult Sauvignon Blanc. He worked for Honada, which is a winery in Santa Barbara that's owned by the folks who make Screaming Eagle, like the most expensive wine in California. And then he worked for Robert Sinsky in Napa. And now he has his own, he has his own wine re, uh, wine label, where he sources grapes, but he makes roughly 3,000 cases of really boutique solely California wines out of Napa. He has a, he shares a tasting room in Napa with a couple other folks, very high quality stuff. Um, my opportunity to talk with a local guy who's become a winemaker in California. Um, who's really very, very down to earth. Um, like, I mean, it'll give everybody the opportunity to talk to somebody who, who, who kind of from nothing became a winemaker and, um, is very quality conscious and does this in, in like, in a really small lot, super cool, hands-on way. Um, excited. The kit's $100. Um, the wines are worth about uh, roughly $115, $120. So I've got a, got a decent discount on those, too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, Chris is giving me some upstate New York uh, airport things. <laughs> Dude, I'm so weirded out by small airports. I don't know why. I love to travel, but small airports are really like, <laughs> I just, I feel, I don't know what weirds, I, I, <laughs> they always weird me out. It just, I feel less safe <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. Why is that, man? <laughs> it makes no sense. 
like they're probably less likely to fuck it up because like they have less to pay attention to and it's less just crazy chaos right yeah um <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I'll put new. Uh, uh, I've got to work out some of the details. I'm gonna do. Um, in April, I have a tasting that we're gonna do with Gary, the winemaker from Gary Farrell Wines in the Russian River Valley. I don't have that up yet, but that's gonna be in the third week of April. I got to work out the details with her. I'll put up some other classes really soon. The Stringer thing is in two weeks. Napa Valley winemaker from Wisconsin. Really great guy. Um, that was my insight into those classes. Thank you so much, Ted and Andrea. You guys are awesome. Uh, I'm, if I'm really ambitious, I'll go through May. Um, all right. Thanks, guys. I'm going to sign off. Take care. Bye-bye.